Welcome to the Authentically American Podcast, featuring inspiring stories from great Americans who are making a difference. Your host is West Point grad, former Army Ranger, and founder of Authentically American, Dean Wagner. Well, welcome to the Authentically American Podcast, featuring inspiring stories of great Americans who are making a difference. I'm your host, Dean Wagner, and I'm here today with my friend and special guest, Dr. Wang. As a way of brief introduction, Dr. Wang is a uniquely qualified corneal refractive surgeon. He holds a Harvard Medical School and MIT degree where he graduated magna cum laude in 1991. He also holds a doctoral degree in laser physics. Dr. Wang is both an accomplished scientist and a talented artist. He is also the founding director of the world-renowned Wang Vision 3D Cataract and LASIK Center right here in Nashville, Tennessee. Dr. Wang, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you, Dean. Mm -hmm. So your story is an unbelievable one. It's a compelling one. And I really want our audience to get to know you on a personal level. So you know, when I was reading more about you and getting to know you, you, know, you grew up in China during one of its history's darkest eras, during the China's Cultural Revolution. So. Tell us what life was like for you growing up. Uh, First of all, Dean, I want to thank you for the invitation Mm -hmm. to be on your show, Authentic American. And I think it's Mm -hmm. so important at this time for our country to really realize what defines us as Americans and to be proud of what we produce, what we make, who we are. And I think a podcast uh, show such as what you have, Authentic American, uh, is really in so much needed in our country at this time. Oh, thank you. Yeah, as, especially I'm honored to get to know you, a veteran who has sacrificed everything you had for our country and uh, um, now transform their energy and dedication and work ethics to creating a business, which not only is a business, mm-hmm. but also it provides the emotional support and make us all proud of things American. I really appreciate that. Thank you. you. And Mm -hmm. uh, regarding your question, Mm -hmm. um, the reason, in fact, I'm excited to be part of this podcast, Authentic American, your show, is that I used to come from a country, a system where there's no freedom. Mm -hmm. Um, I grew up during the Cultural Revolution in China from 1966 to 1976, where the communist government the dictators uh, shut down all universities and colleges of the entire country and forcefully deported every single high school graduate to the poorest part of the country and condemned each one of us a life sentence, a life sentence of hard labor and poverty. And through 10 years of cultural revolution or cultural holocaust, Mm -hmm. they destroyed the future of 20 million young people in that 10 years from 1966 to 1976. So I caught that. And um, so at uh, age 14, when I finished my uh, middle high school, junior high school, I was, despite being a straight student, I was not allowed to continue. And I got thrown out of school together with 20 million others. And uh, I faced with this devastating fate of a labor camp for life. Wow. So it, it's just shocking for me he, sitting here in America and, you know, the freedoms that we hold dear, you know, to hear about the experience that you were destined to. But that's not the way life turned out. You didn't spend a life yes, in I, labor. Um, so tell me how that changed, what, I, that whole journey and what changed. I was in great despair, obviously, as a 14-year-old, despite being a stray student. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to um, become a doctor one day. Mm-hmm but not being able to allow to even go to senior high school, obviously, would um, destroy any hope of that. Uh, Then I had to play an instrument, a music instrument. Mm -hmm. I found out that if I can play an instrument, Mm -hmm. or if I can dance, I might be getting to what they called communist song and dance propaganda troupe. If I could do that, I might be able to avoid being sent away, labor camp, and being allowed to stay in the cities, because the communist government still needed musicians and dancers right. in the cities. Yeah. 
So I was playing music uh, instrument every day and the dance uh, practice every day, trying to avoid labor camp that way. But then the communist government discovered I was playing a music instrument and dance with an ulterior motive, really not for music or art or dance per se, but to avoid labor camp. So they stopped my music practice and dance practice. To uh, give a perspective, um, today it's interesting that many friends here in America, they will you know, sometimes talk to me frequently, say, oh, Ming, it's nice. You have a hobby, you can dance, you can play an instrument. And I always tell them that these were not hobbies when I learned. I learned these uh, to survive. So I was basically going, was going to be deported because wow. music and dance all failed to avoid the labor camp. And then 1976, I was 17, the communist dictator died. Ten years into Cultural Revolution or Cultural Holocaust, the communist dictator died in China. So China woke up, realizing what a tragic mistake it has made by having destroyed the future of 20 million young people, having shut down colleges and universities of the entire country for 10 wow. years. So they reopened all the colleges, stopped the Cultural Revolution, and mom and dad and told me that I, I could go back to school. And I thought I was going to go back to ninth or 10th grade. You know, three years prior, I was kicked out of school after ninth grade. And for three years, I have not been studying. I've been playing music, instrument, learning, dancing, or to avoid labor camp. Now there's a chance to go back to school. I thought I was going to maybe ninth or 10th, but dad wanted me to go straight into 12th. Wow. And I said, why should I do that? He said, you you, 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 only 12 graders can, can uh, be allowed to participate in the college entrance exam. And I said, why can I wait for three years, you know, <laughs> go back, you know, 10th uh -huh. or 11th and go to college, apply for college three years from there. But um, mom said, you got to do it this year because chance may not come again. Communist government shut, can change their mind again next year and shut down colleges again for another 10 years. There's no freedom. There's, um, they can do whatever they want. So I knew I had to do that, doing impossible, jumping three years, you know, overnight. But my parents helped me. We were very poor. The combined salaries of my parents every month was only $15. Very poor. And we didn't have money to Xerox. Actually, I never had a toy growing up. I, we could never afford one. So mom and dad had to borrow some old exams and hand copy those old exams onto little piece of papers they can find around the house. And the drill with me those piece of papers every night with containing those questions. And I was studying like 19, 20, 21 hours a day. Almost killed myself studying. Wow. But I was driven by this glimpse of hope for possibility of for future. I did barely get into college, mm -hmm. but I did not want have anything to do with the communist dictators anymore. I've suffered enough. So 1982, with uh, $50 borrowed from a visiting American professor, uh, with enough money gathered together from relatives for one-way airplane ticket. I, I didn't have money to go back if it didn't work out. With a student visa, I was dropped at National Airport, Washington, D.C. With that $50, with a Chinese English dictionary, knowing no one in this country could hardly speak English, but with a big American dream. I'm just blown away to think of the history. First of all, you thought you were going to pursue academia. That door was shut. Mm -hmm. Then you thought you were going to pursue music. Mm -hmm. That door was shut. And then the window was open. But you had to advance yourself three years. Mm -hmm. Overnight. Overnight. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about your parents because you couldn't do that alone. You mentioned a little bit of how they were helping. Yes. Were they working at a profession at that point? Yes, my uh, father actually was a doctor, believe it or not. My mom is a oh. teacher, and by combined salary for both of them, every month it was only $15. <laughs> it was very poor China during that time. Mm -hmm. But they devoted themselves mm -hmm. to help me to provide their son with an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, they did everything that was possible. And um, uh, as a matter of fact, that um, my story is now being making uh, made into a feature film, full length film now, called Sight. The screenplay of the movie is about to be completed. And uh, in that movie, the, what my parents did during the Cultural Revolution made a big part of it. And uh, so um, now they, uh, they were getting older in the last few years, into mm -hmm. the 70s. So um, 
I realized um, that without what they have done, I would not have today. So as you get older, several years ago, I moved both of them in to live with me for the rest of their lives. They took I was going to ask, how, yeah. how hard was it for them? Yes. You know, their son, they poured their mm-hmm. you know, life savings into yes. to say, okay, we're sending you to America. Yeah, oh, they were very happy because I uh-huh. have a freedom, have a future. And I was able to help them come out and uh, they worked for a period of time. And uh, so several years ago, I moved both of them to live with me for the rest of their lives. They took care of me as a teenager and during the Cultural Revolution. I want to take care of them in that sunset years. Mm-hmm. Well, Dr. Wright, talk to me about this, because I'm blown away the fact that you have $50, you get a flight, you land in Washington National, and you know no one. No. So, you know, tell me more about that story. It's just yeah, everywhere I, we go right now as a family, as a society, yeah. most people say, you know, we know where we're going. We know somebody there. No. You know nobody. Nobody. And I actually came with two guys and two, uh, two fellow students. The situation was exactly the same. We had to find a place to live. And we, um, I had $50, and they have a little bit of money. So combined together, we had to find an apartment. The total rent per month was $100. So we split three ways, so $33 for each of us. And it was a windowless basement apartment, just one room. In one Washington? Room in Washington, one room, um, basement, no window. And three of us had to put, we didn't have, we didn't have beds, so we all slept on the floor. And uh, we had to go to um, trash cans to find pe- the th- sofas people thrown away. So we dragged the sofa back and cleaned them up and things like that. And then um, I, um, I was gi- uh, given a mouse suit. Those are, you know, the high collar, you know, the <laughs> Chairman Mao cultural uh-huh. revolution suit. So I was laughed at at American ca- on campus because people said, wow, you look, you know, funny. So then I knew that I had to change quickly into American right. so I didn't have money I had by then like $15 left mm-hmm. so I said how could I buy any clothes but I found out the Salvation Army's uh, th- uh, thrifty store so I went over there mm-hmm. and with $10 I bought a trash bag of old clothes <laughs> and uh, so I put it on I said well I dress like American American I show fashion up, yeah. exactly I show up on the uh, campus the next day and more people laugh at me this time because it turns out that yes I was dressed like American, all right. I did pick the clothes that people but used to wear 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so it was so like late 60s. People wearing those uh, bell-bottom pants oh, yeah. and tacky you know, patterned shirts. So people uh, joked that you, know, you turned from a, a hippie to a yuppie. <laughs> and, uh, oh. uh, but it was really uh, very exciting time, a very funny time. At the, at the, I didn't have money. I was hungry, so I had to go to McDonald's. That, that's a place I could afford. Mm-hmm. And I was so hungry, I had four Big Macs in a row. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was uh-huh. very humble beginning. No kidding. So you were already a, approved then to attend school here in the U.S.? Yes, I met that professor in mm-hmm. China who helped me um, secure position. I have to work at the same time while studying mm-hmm. um, my uh, doctorate degree in laser physics. Mm-hmm. So the job that the professor helped me secure was to teach undergraduate students some you know, chemistry and physics. But my English was so poor, mm-hmm. I, nobody w- w- could understand me. So I had to learn the language quickly. And uh, my salary was $198 every two weeks. Wow. So I had to live on that to mm-hmm. pay my tuition, room and boards and everything basically $200 every two weeks or $400 a month. But that uh, was plenty for me because China w- then was poorer than that. But also, most importantly, I was free. I get to pursue yeah. what I want to do. You mentioned those two friends, your roommates. Mm-hmm. What's their story? Are you still connected to them? Yes, yes. They, mm-hmm. One became a professor at the University of South Dakota and one became a businessman who found, founded a company, mm-hmm. chemical company, very successful in Pennsylvania. Yeah, and three of us, we call ourselves Three Musketeers, <laughs> as we roam around the American campus uh, wearing funny clothes, eating <laughs> McDonald's, and um, speak with a, you know, uh, Chinglish. <laughs> wow. So, truly, rags to riches story living the american dream you know coming from nothing in poverty to where you're at right now and i've enjoyed starting to read your book 
You're also an esteemed author, and your book, a From Darkness to Sight, A Journey from Hardship to Healing. So what are some of those lessons that you learned early on that you could share with our audience? Um, so far, I've mentioned that mm -hmm. the preciousness of freedom, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what folks like you think that, you know, being a veteran and spend early part of your life defending our country, freedom in this country did not come easily. It came for, with a price. Our founding fathers of America have, um, you know, fought with their lives, and the soldiers and uh, like you that mm -hmm. have fought with your lives. Mm -hmm. So, but the point is that today, people, especially young people in this country, they uh, very often they don't appreciate it, and uh, understand why because if one is born with freedom, always have something one don't tends to one does not tend to appreciate that as much. So my first lesson is uh, we are living in the best country on this planet and we have freedom. The God given freedom and liberty and we should appreciate we should appreciate so much more. And second, uh, so so from that perspective, um, I'm I'm like someone who used to be blind, who came to today tell our sighted folks how precious sight is. Mm -hmm. I'm someone who used to not have freedom, come to tell all the folks today who have freedom in America how precious freedom is. So to appreciate freedom, I think at the end of the day, that all of us need to listen to stories. Mm -hmm feel the pain and suffering of people who used to not have freedom or still don't have freedom okay. and appreciate how much you have. And the second lesson I've learned uh, is I after I came to this country, I thought, well, everything's fine now because there's a freedom, there's a liberty, I could get to pursue what I want. And um, But I realized that's not necessarily so either because even in the best society, in the best place, uh, there could still be challenges, and there could be still people who uh, may not be uh, completely upright. Right. Uh, for example, after I came to this country, I decided since during Cultural Revolution, I was not allowed to study medicine, um, and I w really wanted, now I have the freedom, so I wanted to pursue medicine. And uh, so I uh, made an appointment with um dean of um, a very famous school, Johns Hopkins, and uh, I talked to the dean. I said, I want, I'm, I, I'm interested in studying medicine. Right. He asked me uh, where I'm from. I said, from China. But he basically dismissed me. He said, well, I'm not sure that you will have the intellectual ability or academic ability to compete for medical school. Uh, medical school, even for American graduates, they have to compete so fiercely. I don't think you should waste your time. I don't think you have the ability. So he judged my ability, not knowing what I have done or what I could do as a person, but judged purely based on my skin color and my ethnicity. And uh, that's, of course, is the definition of racial discrimination. Oh, yeah. So I was discriminated against by this professor and also by another professor at the graduate school who really did not believe a student from China would have the intellectual capability to succeed in American universities. Now, keep in mind that nowadays there are many, many Chinese students throughout American universities and they're very successful. But those were early days, you know, 30 some years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I realized that, uh, yes, the environment is important, the country where you live in is important, but those are still just the external factors, that one needs the internal strength, the internal determination, that through external and internal together you can be successful. So even though in the best country, even the best place, there could still be discrimination and challenges and people may not like what you do and they still want to put up obstacles, but we need to realize that it is the inner strength of all of us that no matter what circumstance we are in, mm -hmm. that can we overcome the external factors through our inner strength that really is the key for life. Dr. Wang, your story 
is so timely going back to your first point on freedom because right now there is so much divisiveness in their country there is so much anger and resentment I think most people lose sight of the fact of stories like yours that although we may have differences of opinions our country is founded on freedom you know, there are still opportunities and you've proved it out to live the American dream you know despite you know political divides and everything you know Despite those differences of opinions, you can come here, you can work hard, and you can pursue the American dream. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I always tell everyone, all my friends, including fellow immigrants, America does not have an immigration problem that starts with E, that everybody wants to leave here. Right. So why? Mm -hmm. Why everybody, including myself, mm -hmm. wants to come to live here? That is because America provides something that every human being needs. Peace, security, fairness, and freedom and liberty. Mm -hmm. All us human beings, we all desire the same thing. Peace, security, fairness, freedom, and liberty. America provide that, provides that. So, I think, I mean, yes, indeed, there are lots of negative debates and um, uh, between political parties and between immigrants and uh, people are here already and uh, uh, you know sometimes people say oh I should have this or oh, you take away too much of that my viewpoint is always that we are all so blessed we are oh, all know. so blessed we're living in the greatest country that God has blessed us mm -hmm. And to my fellow immigrants, I always say that we have all chosen to live here. Nobody tells us to live in America. We have fought, we have done everything possible to come to live in this country, and we all have benefited from the clean environment, from peace, liberty, fairness. Um, and we all have the obligation yeah. to pay back. And, uh, you know, for, for my case, I, America is the country that has given me the opportunity to study to become a doctor. So I have the obligation to pay back. So, you know, rather than every side that involves this negative debate or you've taken away too much of that and you should um, ha not have this or I should have this, I think to paraphrase Pres mm -hmm. President Kennedy, mm -hmm. we should ask less what each of us should get yeah. and ask more what together we all can do to help mm -hmm. America. And I think a key point for me is that no one necessarily gave you anything. Mm -hmm. You know, we're the land of opportunity, the land of freedom, but you, know, you talked about that year when you went from ninth grade to twelfth grade, you know, studying nineteen, twenty hours a day. What was it like when you were here? I'm curious to see how hard you were working when you were going to school and also working. Very hard, even to this day. Mm -hmm. Um my I would uh, all my friends like Tony Ash would know that I would send him an email like three o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, sometimes I do get questions from friends. Say, oh, Ming, why you so work so hard? Mm -hmm. You know, why drives what drives you? Mm -hmm. And my answer is very simple. I work so hard. I drive myself, and to continue do better and better in what I do, it's because I have the experience, or used to have nothing. So I think if one has that experience, have gone through that, especially in your youth, that that experience imprinted in me that I appreciate every bit of opportunity today and I want to make the best thing everything I always teach you know I tutor mental many students and I always tell the students that try to do everything you do just one percent better than others just a little bit better mm -hmm. because cumulatively over time you'll be able to do much better than most of people but focus on the fundamental. Focus on everything you do, do the best you can. Yeah, and I just, people don't realize sometimes the amount of work and energy, they probably look at you now and say, look at Dr. Wang. What a fabulous life he's living, but I don't think they really know you know, the sacrifices you made when you grew up in China to the sacrifices when you arrived here in Washington going to school, and mm -hmm. still today. And Yes, in, in my book, mm -hmm. uh, From Darkness to Sight, mm -hmm. I talk much about these challenges. Mm -hmm. And these challenges is not about just working hard. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's also about sacrificing in terms of 
put aside、um, lots of personal enjoyment and things one can do because. When I、uh, face with opportunity, yes, I have the opportunity. But yet, I always feel that God will give us something only after we have put our best effort in first. So opportunities there in America, but that doesn't guarantee that it doesn't say that we all can be lazy and just take for granted. We still the the world is still what we make of it. So then、uh, to work hard to、uh, compete in these universities and.、Uh, Colleges and be able to really learn the skill because I got my doctorate degree in laser physics and then second doctorate degree in medicine. Combine them to do laser eye surgery. I feel that's the best preparation I have. So that's a tremendous amount of dedication work. That means lots of personal sacrifices, um, um, lots of family sacrifices. I've gone through a period of time that、um, because of my dedication、mm-hmm. and focus on work. And I have not been very successful in my personal life, in terms of family life, because I realized that lots of these things that、uh, it comes comes with a price, you know. And、um, so you're right, Dean, that on the surface,、mm-hmm. that people see the overall result, they see the、um, the success, but behind it is a tremendous amount of dedicated work. Twenty-four-seven for decades. Yeah, and what I've come to respect as I get to know you, Doctor Wang, is you know you work hard to provide for yourself and family, but you equally you know work hard for others, and you know you are a practicing surgeon, you know, and a world-renowned eye surgeon, but you're also investing a lot of time and energy in research and innovation and how to improve your practice. I'm also blown away at the list, the long list. Of charities and nonprofits and organizations that you can get involved with. So, tell me what drives you, you know, to focus on others instead of just yourself.、Um, once I became a doctor, I realized I, I'm, I was in a position、mm-hmm. to actually make a difference and a big difference, in particularly regarding side restoration surgeries. And uh, uh, I realized that we,、uh, the patients. Human being get blind after injury is because the scar. We all scar after injury, and the original、uh, injury one can heal from it, but very often it's the scarring process that blinds one. So I started research、um, about two two and a half decades ago how to find a solution to prevent human scarring after injury so we can preserve eyesight. And、uh, um, that started a lifelong dedication of how to restore sight in patients who have suffered injuries. And I realized all of the scars. And then we, I found that the fetus, a baby before birth, they don't scar.、Mm. In mother's womb, a fetus does not scar、yeah. because in this clean environment and had time to regenerate. Well, once we're born, we take on a different process called fibrosis or scarring. So then I realized if we can somehow understand how the little fetus, a baby, can heal without scar, we can transfer that technology, or understanding that to help adult patients. But then, how could we do that fetal research without hurting a baby? You know, so it's a challenge. And、um, I was I was born as an atheist, and I found God in this country, found Christ in this country. So by then I became a Christian already. So I found that. As a Christian, as a human being, I could not bring myself to conduct any research that would hurt the baby. But yet, I do want to find out、mm-hmm. how can we tap the scarless、uh, healing property of a fetus and benefit adult injured patients to restore their eyesight. So I continued that research for almost twenty years, trying to find a solution.、Mm-hmm. Eventually, stumbled upon the、um, amniotic sac, the placenta,、mm-hmm. and.、Uh, We get the placenta donated by mother after giving birth to a child, and the bioengineer the placenta amniotic sac into amniotic placenta contact lenses. Then put these youthful healing, no scar placenta contact lenses onto older patients' eyes to help their eyesight heal after injury. So that's a line of research that's been going on for almost thirty、uh, years now. That in terms of helping patients after injury using. Placenta amniotic technology、mm-hmm. that tapping the fountain of youth, but yet without touching any part of the baby.、Wow. 
And by the way, we are taking donations of placentas from mothers mm-hmm. after giving birth to a child because placenta and neonatal sac is discarded anyway. Mm-hmm. So along that research process, we realized that many patients that even though you have the advancement of medical technology, they could not afford it. So that doesn't help. If you have the technology, patients cannot afford it. So while I was doing the placenta research, uh, I established a foundation. And specifically, mm-hmm. it's for patients who, despite the advancement of medical technologies today, they could not afford these technologies. So it's a uh, group of doctors, eye doctors, we all donate our services. And um, when we get a patient, uh, we evaluate them to find out um, if they medically qualify for the help. And uh, then if they do medically can be helped and financially they do need help, they could not afford it, they have no insurance, things like that. Then we foundational step in with doctors, we donate our services. And through the placenta technology um, and, and this research, we've been helping, being able to help patients basically from all over the world. Our foundation today has had help, has helped patients from over 55 countries now, over 40 wow. states in the United States with all side restoration surgeries performed free of charge. And um, your question is very good, uh, Dean, that is what drives me to do the charity mm-hmm. work? Because a significant portion of my time is devoted for these foundation yeah. patients. Now our current focus is blind orphan children to help them. Um, I think the motivation and devotion came from the fact that when I saw, when I see someone who is suffering Mm -hmm. in darkness, um, I found myself that I can relate to them and I can feel their pain and suffering because I used to suffer myself. I was in their shoes and uh, I used to be in the darkness, in the physical darkness, no freedom. And uh, so I used to think it was negative in the sense that I used to suffer as a, you know, during Cultural Revolution in China as a teenager and not being able to go to school, got kicked out of school after ninth grade and have to be deported to labor camp for life. I used to think it's a negative, mm-hmm. you know, that I wish I never had to go through that. But nowadays I look at it in some way it's positive, meaning it gives me a better appreciation of what we have today, give me a broader perspective life, Mm -hmm. and give me an inner understanding and emotional connection to people who are suffering today, because I used to suffer. Dr. Wang, I'm blown away at the impact that you're having not just here in Nashville, not just here in Tennessee, not just here in the United States, but you mentioned 55 countries. Mm -hmm. Yes. So literally, you know, a global impact you're having. And that's why I respect and appreciate so much because at Authentically American, one of the things we're passionate about is giving back. Yes. And we're intentional about donating to two veteran and first responders charities. But the idea, it's not about either one of those charities. It's about when you're successful as an individual and organization, you need to be intentional about how you're giving back. And, you know, literally around the world, you know, people are feeling the impact of your drive and your willingness to serve others. I, I totally agree, I, especially mm-hmm. in an organization like yours, uh, Authentic American. Think about, on the surface, we say, well, we support um, things made in America. We support what we provide, what we produce to the rest of the world. Yes, indeed, we need much support. We need to be proud of what we make in this country. We need to educate the rest of the world what we have to offer. Mm-hmm. But I think deep down, the significance goes beyond that is what is things American, what that stands for. Right. That stands for an, a fundamental appreciation of human liberty, mm-hmm. of human dignity, the importance of um, we all should, with God's blessing, that pursue each of us our own dreams. You know? And that's what things Americans stand for. You know, well, as I mentioned, America attract people from around the world. Oh, yeah. But what, what makes this country so great, made this country that being a, become a magnet? It's because of this spirit that, uh, that, that, that comes from its people. It's American people who exemplify the spirit of appreciating, understanding, respect, human dignity, and human liberty. 
So at the end, mm -hmm. what you're doing, uh, things Authentic America and many other people are doing to support things we make in America and support American principle and spirit mm -hmm. goes beyond the product. It's about supporting and appreciating the essence things American. Thank you. I appreciate that. Let me do it. Let me shift gears literally from one side of your brain to the other because you mentioned your Christian faith. Mm -hmm. I mean, God has given you a brilliant mind. You don't go to Harvard and MIT and graduate magna cum laude you know, without being gifted with an amazing mind. But that would be the left side, the logic side of your brain. So let's jump over to the right side, the creative side. Did I hear right? You're also a ballroom dancer? Yes. Tell me um, more about that. I learned dancing during Cultural Revolution, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, to survive. Uh, because mm -hmm. if I could dance or play a music instrument, I may be able to get into communist song and dance propaganda troupe and being allowed to stay in the cities and avoid being sent away to labor camp. But that was, did not work. The government discovered I was practicing dancing for an ulterior motive, not for dancing, but to avoid labor camp. They stopped my dance practice. But after I came to this country, I re-picked up dancing. Mm -hmm. um, actually, it was uh, first year at Harvard Medical School. A bunch of us got together, <laughs> Harvard students, and we wanted to do something that is not that was not expected of us, being mm -hmm. bookworms. Yeah. So we picked up out of not randomly mm -hmm. ballroom dancing, and partly probably because I had some dancing background. Mm -hmm. So we formed a team, we competed, uh, but we were dead last in the country, <laughs> and, and as a collegiate team, so. Uh -huh. We, we couldn't dance well. The, the men could not lead and ladies could not follow. And sometimes uh, it's funny to watch our team practice and we'll step on each other. Sometimes team members got into fight. Right. And then we hired a coach who taught us and uh, she said, uh, boys, you're all the leaders. We said, oh yeah, we're the leaders. All the ladies fall. They couldn't follow. But she said, no, not necessarily. She said, um, you are leaders, but have you heard about the pre-lead? We said, what's that? Uh, she said, pre-lead means that, man, before you actually move as the leader, you have to develop an intention of moving, not moving yet. And you have to expand within your body to demonstrate that intention while still standing still. And you have to give your partner, the lady in your arm, the, the time to understand your intention. And you have to wait for her feedback. You may not want to go where you want to go. You have to negotiate, compromise, and come up with a direction that you both want to go. And only when you know both knows the musicality, timing, speed, then and the direction of movement, then you move. So all that is accomplished in a split a second called pre-lead. Right. So the most important thing about dancing, what I learned, is not just about music or about physical exercise. Those are important. But the third most underappreciated benefit of ballroom dancing is human connection. Mm -hmm. It's to understand each other and recognize no matter how great one is by oneself, if you just move by yourself, you can never become a together ballroom dancer together. So it's about human connection. So through that, I continue my dance practice and continue to pursue the dance. And uh, I still dance twice a week and I'm in active uh, competition circles. My highest achievement in dancing was, uh, a, f uh, was a finalist in the United States uh, Pro-Am International Style uh, uh, Ten Dance. So you're not last place anymore. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes, oh, actually speaking of that, uh -huh. our, our Harvard team learned pre-lead. <laughs> right. uh, all the men became better leaders and because we all learned, learned the sensitivity and awareness mm -hmm. of the partner. Actually, when I f uh, graduated from Harvard Medical School, we won the U.S. National Collegiate Championship. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So I continue uh -huh. dance. But mm -hmm. it's interesting that, mm -hmm. that the, I realize that we all have the right brain, a left brain, as you mentioned. The left brain is the mathematical, the logical. Mm -hmm. The right brain is the creative, the intangible. And sometimes people say, oh, I'm left brain, I can't do this right brain stuff. Or I'm right brain, I cannot do the mathematical stuff. What I learned in life is it's not about separating the two half of the brain. It's about making them work together. Yeah. So when I pursue a left brain activity, such as eye surgery, which is very logical, <laughs> sequential, precise, uh -huh. scientific, I apply my right brain skill to see 
for that particular patient with what he or she needs to do in life. How can I just, not just about the, applying the technology, but applying understanding of what he or she is, what he or she is passionate doing, and devise, customized device, a vision function that fits her or his needs and yeah. his or her emotions. Mm -hmm. So in other words, I'm using the right brain skills to a left brain activity in this mm -hmm. improve the eye surgery, uh, uh, the treatment result customized to each person's specific emotional needs. But when I pursue a right brain activity such as ballroom dancing, yeah. I apply my left brain skills. When I learn, one of the reasons I could learn dance uh, well is because I apply the physics, the mechanics, the understanding <laughs> of uh, uh, momentum, <laughs> torques, and um, speed and force. So I always tell myself and friends that it's not about being a one side of the brain and couldn't do the other side. It's about putting them together. And when you put the left and right brain together, you get an interesting effect. You get the effect of one plus one being more than two, yeah. not just equal to, mm -hmm. more than two. So the synergistic additional effect. So in my case, I found my bone dancing, which is very um, right brain activity, help my left brain profession, which has been an eye doctor, eye, eye surgeon, very left brain, very logical. Because the, one of the most important things, which is underappreciated as a doctor today, mm -hmm. is how do you listen? And now it truly became a hobby um, that I um, use it to play and express my appreciation to America, you know, uh, that joy and the, uh, freedom, and also to bring the cultural roots of China to America because America is increasing a diverse country and diversity is a strength, not a weakness. <clears throat> diversity is good. But even dancing I learned during Cultural Revolution and become a hobby as well. Our foundation have an annual event, a ball, a gala that raises money to help people see and we call it the eyeball. It's a beautiful event. You come to eyeball, you see the beautiful, spectacular beauty of ballroom dancing. Mm -hmm. But the most importantly is that beauty reminds you how precious sight is. Because without sight, you cannot see all the beautiful things in life and how much we need to help those who have lost sight. Yeah. Well, tell me a story because i fascinated by this instrument that are you that's been around so long. So you know how to play that. And then I also heard a story about you playing the air you and another great American, Dolly Parton. Yes. <laughs> Tell me about that story. Um, yes, uh -huh. I've been playing Erhu Chinese violin since Cultural Revolution to, mm -hmm. you know, to escape labor camp at the mm -hmm. time. Now it became a hobby. And um, uh, I enjoy playing uh, both Eastern song and Western songs. And uh, the, uh, with Dolly, it's interesting. One day she came in. Uh, I did LASIK surgery for her. Uh, so she's a patient years. for yes. years. And uh, she came in one day and she said, Dr. Wang, I'm not here for my uh, eyes. I said, what are you here for? She said, I'm here for, my, uh, for music. I said, yes. She said, I heard you play uh, a little Chinese violin. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I'm thinking, could we do something together, East and West? And, you know, I sing a song <laughs> and you play uh, the Chinese violin. I said, that's an interesting uh -huh. idea. But then I said, you, you know, uh, country music icon right. play music with me <laughs> is a closet I'm, I consider myself closet musician it's music just something I do myself and you know uh, for fun and she said yes so I um, she invited me to a uh, music um, recording studio called Blue Ocean Studio it's a big studio and I arrived there and I never seen mm -hmm. thousands of buttons like on these tables I've never seen mm -hmm. and she uh, give me a chair and she said okay here's what I want to do um, I'm going to sing this old country song called The Cruel War about a story about a, um, during the Civil War a young lady wants to go to war front following her um, sweetheart and he kept saying no you can't go you can't go and she said I want to go I want to go at the end he said yes <laughs> so it's a beautiful song The Cruel War and uh, so we heard, uh, she, she sent the recorded, and uh, we heard all the record, uh, re recording, and um, then she said, okay, this is my part, the song part, she already sang, by, alone, without instrument, mm -hmm. accompaniment. And she said, are you ready? I said, yeah, I have my instrument. And uh, she got the sound engineer, and she herself sitting right by me, and she's ready to record. And I said, no problem, give me the score. She said, I have no score. I said, oh, you have no score for my part? She said, no, I don't have score. 
I said, okay, give me the score of your part, the your singing part. She had no score either because she apparently remembered the song. She just sang、mm -hmm. based on memory. Didn't need it. So I said, oh, you really want me to compose <laughs> <laughs> my a who accompaniment for your old country song? She said yes. So we sat together with another guy named Tom. Three of us, a little table like this. So we listened a little part of the Cool World her song. We pause, then I. Try it out on my Chinese violin and to see what a tune that should be to accompany that country song. And Tom wrote it down, and we just keep on this trying out. You know, it's it's almost as if three of us in the middle of the three of us were trying to imagine something that basic has never done before. What would a ancient Chinese music instrument or who <laughs> melody be like to accompany old American country, country song?、Music. Yeah, so it's a one of these. Exciting, creative East and West experience.、Mm -hmm. But by the end of the night, we composed my Arhu part. I played it. We recorded it. We're done. So it's, it's a the CD <laughs> that in music store.、Uh -huh. The CD is entitled、mm -hmm. "Those Were the Days," and that's the title song and song number eight.、And、on the CD is interesting. You see all these musicians listed. She、yeah. got other, many other、uh, country star listed. You know Dolly Parton, Alison、mm -hmm. Cross, and others. Ming Wei. And he said, "Who is that guy?" Dolly said, <laughs> "East and West coming、That's、together." Right, yeah, fantastic. So, two more questions for you, and I think the next one, you know, ties how you and I first met, and that was at your home. You know, you were hosting a fundraiser, a celebration event for the Nine Seventeen Society,、yes. and I think that so fitting, you know, given your history and your journey from China immigrant to here. So, tell everybody about the Nine Seventeen Society and why you're so passionate about supporting it. Nine、uh, Seventeen Society is started by a remarkable young lady named Joni Bryan,、mm -hmm. and her、uh, realization and her inspiration starting the Nine Seventeen Society a couple years ago was that she realized that many American citizens have not studied the fundamental document, the Constitution, that is the basis for our liberty and freedom in this country.、Right. You know, America、uh, has freedom. And liberty, not because of one particular individual or person, but because the system, system that guaranteed, protected by the Constitution. So while many immigrants, like myself, you know, I study Constitution because I have to pass the citizenship test, but many Americans、mm -hmm. born here never had the chance, other than maybe in school cursory study, never actually pass those tests. So she realized that one way to help our young people, the eighth graders. To uh, develop uh, more appreciation to the freedom and liberty、uh, that we have in America is to build a system to encourage youngsters to study American Constitution. So she started this organization called Nine Seventeen Society because Nine Seventeen September Seventeen、mm -hmm. is the Constitution Day, and、uh, so she started the organization. The goal is to provide a copy of the American Constitution. To every eighth graders in Tennessee, ultimately America, and、uh, have teachers sign those constitutions, and、uh, it's a personal touch, and teach encourage teachers and students study constitution together. I joined the organization、um, then, and uh, uh, I realized that the most important, one of the very important part is is a voluntary, voluntary,、uh, volunteer based organization, five hundred one c nonprofit, and everybody. Contribute the time. So, how do we sustain that effort? And in order to sustain that effort, all the printing costs and everything is to provide a sustained financial support. So, I helped Johnny.、Uh, we founded a, the Funders Club,、yes. meaning I recruit all my friends and trying to get people to join, become a Funders member,、mm -hmm. and each of us commit every year a financial support to the Nine Seventeen Society. Allow the Nine Seventeen Society, led by Joni, to be continued, be able to、uh, provide the、um, American Constitution to every eighth, eighth graders in Tennessee and ultimately in the United States. So that's a inspirational project, and for me, it is particularly inspiring because as an immigrant, I realize that's the most precious things about、foundation. America. It's the、yeah. foundation,、yeah. and through this particular effort, Nine Seventeen Society, I found myself be able to play a part. In helping, protecting, upholding what's most important in America—the Constitution. Yeah, and Dr. Thanks to Joni's leadership, she's a great friend. 
and mm-hmm. she is so passionate yes. about making a difference, as are you. And thanks to your support and others in the Founding Club, I think it's to the point now where every single eighth grader mm-hmm. you know, is receiving a copy of the Constitution, and that is the foundation yes. of our great American country and those values mm-hmm. and everything we hold dear. So yes. one last question. So you have lived truly the American dream, a rags to riches story, an immigrant in China that was sentenced to labor for the rest of your life to the point now. So there's other people that say, is the American dream still alive? What advice would you give to somebody that is in similar circumstances that whether they're an immigrant, whether they're here on hard luck, that's looking to pursue the American dream, what advice would you give them? It's a great question because many people who um, have started with American dream and have s- suffered some sep- setbacks yeah. and uh, some of them have become disillusioned and felt that American dream is not for them. Mm-hmm. And uh, my advice, I have two advices. Number one, it is America is the land of opportunity. It's the best country on this planet that provides something all of us want. That's why so many people want to come to live here in America. So if we are in America, we should appreciate that opportunity yes. freedom and we should pay back. We have an obligation as a human being, not just benefit from what this great country can provide us, but to pay back, to keep it mm-hmm. strong. Second advice is that, yes, America and God has provided us the opportunity, but that does not guarantee at all that we'll be successful. We have to take advantage of the opportunity, and we have to do our own part. External factors, such as the environment that provided by this country, the blessing that God has given this country, can only work through internal determination. External environment can only, one can only achieve success by applying, take advantage of external environment, but ultimately through internal own effort. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we need to recognize that if we don't put in our own effort, we will not be successful. America is not just an opportunity and freedom, liberty. It also comes with it responsibility. Mm-hmm. That means we all need to contribute. We all need to recognize we have to participate in this great co- uh, society in America. We need to vote. We need to do our part. You know, it's about the Constitution is about less government, more individual responsibility. So my, my advice is basically to take advantage of the freedom opportunity, but yes. realize ultimately it's the responsibility is our each individual choice. Are we going to make the best out of this opportunity? So well said, Dr. Wang, because we live in the land of opportunity, but it's up to each and every one of us to take advantage of that opportunity and pour our life's work into it. So, Sarah, can you do me a favor and grab me the bag there? Because we have a gift for you. Oh, okay. Thank you. For joining us here. And I think it'll be very appropriate for you being a great American, being a patriot, and being a supporter. So... Two of them. One will go very well with how you dress today. So these are our authentically American patriotic flag socks. So oh, one is yes. stars, one is stripes. So yes. that will go well today you. with your outfit. Thank you. And then when you really want to get wild and crazy, maybe at the next 917 event or 4th of July, but we also have one that's even more patriotic with the red and blue. So the oh. red stripes <laughs> with the blue. Yes, yes, yes. So that's one gift we had for you. And then as an Another way to say thank you and you being so dedicated to giving back as we talked about. So at Authentically American, there's two primary charities that we support. One is the Folded, Fla- the Folded Flag Foundation, who helps Gold Star families. The other one is Reboot Alliance. They have a faith-based program for PTSD for veterans and first responders. So we are going to make a donation to both of those organizations on your behalf. Oh, thank you. And keep us posted, the opportunity that we can participate and support as well, your effort. And I feel, as I said, uh, authentic American is not just about mm-hmm. the product made America. Mm-hmm. It's about emotional support, what is in principle American. Well, Dr. Wang, you're a great American. You've got an inspiring story. Thank and you. thank you for making a difference. Thank you. All right.
Thank you. Thank you.